Charge, conductors, and insulators is going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now this lesson is really an introduction to a new chapter on electric forces and fields, and just like we saw with gravity, uh, we're going to be able to give a good description for these electric forces and fields, uh, and because we have some familiarity with it, it's going to make us feel like we understand it. Uh, but make no mistake, we're better at giving a description of it than getting a really deep understanding of it, just like was the case with gravity. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, it would make a lot of sense if we started this lesson off by first providing a definition for charge. Uh, but we're going to struggle with that, it turns out, and just like with gravity, uh, we're going to be able to provide more of a description of what charges do rather than an actual definition. So that's going to be true throughout the whole chapter here. So it uh, turns out uh, there are two types of charges, and we're going to use an early convention that was adopted long, long ago, and one's called positive, one's called negative. And we know that like charges, either two positives or two negatives, uh, repel each other. So these two positive charges would feel a repulsive charge away from each other. Same thing with these two negative charges. And then light charges are attracted to each other. And again, I haven't really supplied a definition of what charge is. I've only supplied a description of what charges do. So, but this is the way it works. Uh, and just like with uh, any other property we introduce, we're first going to talk about the SI unit. And it turns out the SI unit is the Coulomb, abbreviated with a C. And Coulomb was one of the early guys to study uh, electric forces and fields. Uh, and in this case, the Coulomb, it turns out, is a phenomenal amount of charge. It's like uh, the amount of charge you might find in like a lightning bolt or something like this. And, and so typically the problems we're going to deal with are going to deal with much smaller amounts of charge. And it's not uncommon to deal with like micro Coulombs and nano Coulombs and pico Coulombs and things of this sort. So, but the Coulomb is indeed the SI unit for charge. Now it turns out there's also a fundamental charge, and here's a value you're going to want to know. And we symbolize it with the letter E, as we'll see here. So it's 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So it turns out the nature of charge and matter comes down to protons and electrons. Protons have a positive charge, electrons a negative charge, and this is the magnitude of that charge. So when, you know, in a chemistry class, we might say that a proton has a plus one charge and an electron has a minus one charge. Well, what we really mean is plus one or minus one of that fundamental charge. And so the truth is, a proton actually has a charge of positive 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. An electron has a charge of negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And any substance that turns out has any sort of positive or negative charge either has an excess of protons or an excess of electrons. And that's just the way it works. But as a result then, then any charge uh, any kind of piece of matter has is going to be some multiple of this number. If you have, let's say, two more electrons than protons, well, in chemistry, we might refer to an ion that has two more electrons than protons. We might have referred to it as having a minus two charge. So, but the truth is, it's just going to have negative two times 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs of charge uh, in this case. And again, every charge ultimately has to come down to this uh, imbalance of protons and electrons and therefore have to be some multiple of this number that's super duper duper important. So it could be a multiple of nine times this or 10 times this, but it can't be like 4.7 times this number is the charge on something. It doesn't work that way. This is the most fundamental unit of charge. You can't get smaller than this. And every charge on an object has to be some multiple of this number, either on the positive side or the negative side. You should also know that electrons are much, much, much lighter, somewhere in the ballpark of like, you know, one eighteen hundredth the mass of a proton. And so as a result, electrons are transferred much more easily than protons. Also, protons are sequestered in the nucleus of an atom, whereas electrons are kind of on the outskirts in the electron cloud, we might say. Uh, and typically, if there's going to be charge being transferred back and forth between objects, it's these much lighter electrons that are on the outskirts of atoms that are being transferred, not the protons. Last thing you should know is that charge is conserved. So if something changes its charge, it's not because charge just vanished off, you know, out of existence or something like that. It's because charge was transferred from one object to another. But the overall number of protons and electrons between all the objects in play is going to be conserved. 
All right, we got a couple other definitions to go with, and it's conductor and insulator, kind of hence the title of this lesson. And, uh, a conductor is any material that allows charge to be kind of move around freely throughout that substance. So uh, typically we have to think of metals as conductors. And let's say I've got a, a metal sphere here. And let's say this metal sphere has excess electrons. So it's going to have an overall negative charge. What you'll find out is that these negative charges all repel each other. And being a conductor, it's going to allow these electrons to move freely throughout the substance. And so what are they going to do? Well, they're going to get as far apart as possible. And so on the they're going to all move to the outer parts of this sphere. So if they were all towards the middle, they would be closer together. But again, they repel each other like charges repel. And so as a result of this being a conductor, they're going to move and kind of distribute themselves all along the surface of that metal sphere. And that's typical of conductors. Now, an insulator, on the other hand, is going to get a little bit more of a negative definition. It's kind of any material that is not a conductor is an insulator. Uh, and typically don't allow the transfer of electrons in the same way and things of this sort as, as conductors and definitely don't allow electrons to just kind of move around freely throughout that substance. Now to kind of muddy the water here, sometimes we also define what's called a semiconductor and semiconductors are somewhere kind of intermediate between conductors and insulators, which makes that negative definition of insulator a little bit problematic because we said anything that's not a conductor is an insulator. And then we decide to throw semiconductors into the mix. So. However, semiconductors are somewhat conductive, not typically as conductive as, say, metals and things of a sort. Uh, and it turns out like their temperature dependence of their conductivity is going to be different and things of a sort. Uh, but things like silicon, uh, the, the kind of standard for the semiconductor industry. Um, but they're somewhat intermittent between insulators and conductors in their properties, including conductivity. All right, next we want to use the word charging. And charging just means uh, imparting a charge to an object. And typically this is going to happen in one of two primary ways. And the first we call charging by conduction. So, and this is when two objects come into contact and because of a difference in charge, there's going to be a flow of electrons from one to the other, typically from the more negative to the more positive, or you could say the less positive to the more positive. But there's going to be a flow of electrons, typically if they're in contact long enough until they have the same charge. So we'll see this in a question here shortly. And then there's going to be charging by induction, which is a little more complicated. So if we take a look at, say, uh, a sphere here, and we're going to take a charged rod. So and in this case, we're going to say this rod has an overall negative charge, so an excess of negative charges. And I'm going to bring it close to the sphere, which is neutral. And what's going to happen is it's going to cause the negative charges in the sphere to kind of move to one side, leaving a positive charge behind on the other side, just due to the repulsion from the negative, negatively charged rod right here. But if I move this rod away, so the distribution will move back if, as long as this is a conducting sphere and the charges are free to move. But what we can do is we can take and connect this sphere to the ground with a wire. So and it turns out we'd say that this thing is now grounded. So and ultimately is uh, connecting it with a conducting wire to the ground uh, gives it access to more electrons. We like to think of the Earth as an infinite reservoir of electrons. It can supply electrons as many as you might need, or it can receive uh, and suck up electrons as many as you might want to give it. It is an infinite reservoir of electrons. And so as long as we're grounded here, electrons can flow to the Earth or electrons can flow from the Earth into the sphere. So what we're going to do here uh, in this case and in making it grounded is that now in order for these electrons to move away from this negatively charged rod, some of them are actually going to move down towards the Earth. And so we're going to lose some of these electrons. So in the process, just trying to get away from this negatively charged rod. And again, I still haven't brought these into contact. I've just brought them close together. And so we can see that this sphere has been induced to have a charge. But once again, if I move this rod away, these electrons will come back from the Earth and it'll go back to being neutral just like it was before. So the difference though is what we can do is we can disconnect the wire. We're just going to disconnect it while this rod is still nearby. And then we're going to move this rod away. And what we'll see is that because we're no longer connected to the Earth, we don't get these electrons back from the Earth, from our reservoir, once we move this rod away. And overall, we've induced a net positive charge in this lovely sphere now. And so, and because we've induced it, that's why we call this charging by induction. No contact was ever made between this rod and this sphere. So that's why we can't call it conduction. So, but we've induced it to have a charge only because it was grounded and then uh, that grounding was removed once a charge was imparted to it. So again, had we not removed the grounding wire, no net charge would have been imparted uh, uh, in the end uh, to that lovely sphere. So we're going to finish this lesson off with a little bit of practical application. And 
Uh, example here says, if the following two conducting rods are brought into contact for an extended period and then separated, what charge will remain on each of them? So we've got negative 10 microcoulombs on one, positive 16 microcoulombs on the other. We're gonna bring them into contact and that's gonna allow uh, charges to be transferred. So this is charging by conduction, they're brought into contact and electrons are gonna to wanna to transfer from the more negative to the more positive. And I want you to think about why that is exactly. Well, in this case, electrons here, there's a excess electrons over here that are repelling each other. There's excess protons on this side, a lack of electrons, if you will, on this side. So the electrons are attracted uh, towards the positive 16 microcoulombs, the excess of protons, and repelled away from the excess of electrons. And this impetus for the electrons to transfer, provided they're in contact long enough, will continue until there's no more impetus for them to transfer. And that's gonna ultimately be when they have the same charge and there's no reason for the electrons to wanna transfer back and forth at that point. All right, now we have to remember that charge is conserved. And this in this case means not necessarily charge on any one of these two rods, but the charge of this system as a whole. And with negative 10 microcoulombs and positive 16 microcoulombs, that's an overall charge of positive six microcoulombs. And if charge is conserved and these are gonna end up with the same charge, then we can just split that in half and say that positive three microcoulombs would be on the rod on the left and positive three microcoulombs on the rod on the right. And it would still add up to a total of positive six microcoulombs and charge is conserved. So again, this was just pretty much an introductory lesson, not a whole lot to it that wasn't uh, definitional, just a little bit of practical application. But in the next lesson, we're gonna start hitting some math and we start dealing with Coulomb's Law. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.